Welcome, everyone. This is Greg Rock, and we're thrilled to kick off Business Architecture Institute webcast series this year with a presentation from both Jeff Scott, our Editorial Director and President of Business Innovation Partners, along with Diane LeBeau, Director of Business Architecture with United. Part of our theme this year from Business Art Institute is that we are going to be focusing on helping business architecture practitioners from the startup of their programs to making those programs sustainable. And as part of that effort, we're reaching out to experienced practitioners in the industry to share some of the successes of the programs that they've had uh, with our general members. And uh, for those that have been with us over the years, they may remember that uh, we did a profile on United uh, way back a few years ago. And uh, Diane LeBeau and the folks at United have been gracious enough to return and give us an update on their efforts and to share some of the lessons learned over the years. But first, uh, to set the tone on uh, things to help groups get started successfully, I'd like to turn things over to Jeff Scott. Thanks, Greg, and welcome, everyone. Over the last uh, few years, actually the last 10 years, I have been involved in business architecture and have played numerous roles from uh, industry analyst to individual architecture consultant. And in doing those roles, I've been able to talk with a couple of hundred architects, business architects, every year. And as I do that, so, uh, some interesting things have unfolded. What I see is there are two big pools of business architects out there today. There's the pool who are trying to get started, just beginning, maybe into this a year, maybe a little bit longer. But these are the folks who are in the very beginning phases of establishing a business architecture practice. Then there's another pool of people who have, in essence, made it. They kind of crossed the three-year mark. They are well integrated into their organization, largely recognized for what they bring to the table. Uh, they're not they're they're not golden yet. They still have to continue marketing um, and in selling themselves some. But largely, um, they they consider themselves successful. Their senior management considers them successful. I consider them successful. And the interesting thing about these two groups is they think about business architecture differently, and they approach executing business architecture quite differently. And as I work with new architects, one of the hardest things I find is to get them to understand how successful architects are working. So I want to talk about some of those challenges today and give you a few hints about things you might want to think about. So before I start, though, I want to set the stage with about where we are. And here are some interesting facts. First. Business architects are really some of the smartest guys around. When I go into companies to help uh, with, with business architecture, I never find a group of guys that I'm, that I'm sitting there thinking, my God, they can't do it. These, they're always very bright people. So the, the people we have doing this got all the, all the smarts they need to make it happen. The second fact is that business architects have more latitude than other organizations to create their role to be what they want it to be. And the reason for that is whoever they work for doesn't know anything about business architecture. For most roles, when you go to work in a role, the person who is above you has frequently had your role, is heavily experienced in it, and knows exactly how they think it should be done. Not true for business architects. When a business architecture function starts up, the business architects themselves are, really have almost total control over how they design the function. The third thing is, is that business architects really have fewer time-dependent uh, deliverables than most organizations. Yet you, you don't have unlimited time to make this happen. But the fact is, as you start this organization up, you do have a fair amount of time. It's not like running uh, on a really tight deadline. Very, very few business architects get the message, okay, we need a business architecture team. You've got six weeks. Make it happen. That, that just, that's not the way it works. So there's plenty of time. And then the last really important point here is that organizations really are in desperate need of 
innovative business design, strategy implementation, transformation management, all the things that business architecture offers them. So we got smart people. We, we, we get to define it the way we want to. We've got time to set it up and do it right. Our companies really need us. And yet, what we see is business architecture teams struggle for success. They struggle to get off the ground, they struggle to make an impact, and they struggle for sustainability. And so as I notice all of these things, I'm sitting here thinking, why is this? We can create it like we want to. We're smart enough to create a successful practice. So what's going on? One thing here about this is there's a tremendous amount of failure. Um, Forrester Research did an article a couple of years ago where they indicated 64% of business architecture initiatives fail. So that data is pretty well established, and, and I feel like that's really right on target. For me, about 20% of the, of the rest of the group is struggling for success. They're, they're trying to make things happen. Maybe 15% are doing good journeyman work. In other words, they're building good models. They're occasionally having a win somewhere, those kind of things. But a very small number. I, I have 5%. It, it's really much smaller than that. My peers beat on me when I talk about 1%, 2%. So I finally just gave in and said, okay, 5%. Let's call it that. But, but the reality is a very small number are truly delivering what we all think of as the promise uh, business architecture, bringing the organization together, executing strategy fast, all those kind of things. Now, most of you who are listening in today probably do not know who this little figure on, on the right is, uh, but that figure is Pogo, who was a late 60s, early 70s comic strip character, and he was somewhat of a philosopher, and his most famous quote was, we have met the enemy, and he is us. And I grabbed on to that quote when I, as I was thinking about why, why are business architects struggling here. So here's some of the things that I see. One is we, as business architects, won't change to happen our way. So we have a model about how it's supposed to work, and we're very reluctant to engage in the organization and modify what we're doing to make it work for everybody. We have a specific way we want it to work, and we want it to work our way. We largely ignore culture and context. So back to the 60% failure rate, what was the number one reason business architecture programs failed, according to Forrester Research? Culture and politics. And yet, every time I talk to a business architecture program, leader about, oh, what are you doing about culture? Oh, we're not doing anything about that. We can't change that. We can't control that. So we're just not going to think about it. So the problem is, is we continue to ignore one of the things that's the most important thing for us to get a grasp on. Although this is getting better, we're still fairly technology-centric. Over half business architecture practices are now in the business. That transformation happened in the past 12 months. Uh, where we got more than half that are in the business and out of IT, but even most of those in the business have a very, very strong technology bent, and, and that's kind of slowing things down. We, and we look at efficiency more than effectiveness, and this kind of comes, I think, from our technical backgrounds where efficiency is, is a really important thing for IT organizations for how we run technology. But when you start talking to leadership about what's important to them, it shifts from efficiency to effectiveness. Yes, they want an efficient organization, but they want that so they can take the money they gain out of the efficiencies and apply it to executing their strategies. And, and so there, there's, by focusing on the efficiency side, we're limiting the impact that we can have. We want to control versus collaborate. Uh, this one is fascinating to me. When you look at why companies have problems executing their strategy, it's because there's very little collaboration across the organization. We talk about this as the silo problem. Well, how do you fix that? You get people to collaborate. How do you get people to collaborate? You collaborate with them, which means you can't be in control of everything. We want to focus much more on models than the actual results 
And in fact, if you listen to many business architecture pundits, they will talk about business architecture as a blueprint for the company, as if that's our job to create blueprints and models. And at the end of the day, we would largely rather be right than actually be successful. There is a tremendous amount of energy in the business architecture world about the right way to do things and the right answer. So some of this going on today, there are other things outside of our control for sure, but there's a lot of stuff going on that hinders us that, that really we could address. So let's take a quick look at where business architecture is today. Uh, one of the things I get to do is, a, is do a lot of in-depth interviews with architects, both the beginning architects and the successful architects and, and those who are way out on the right who are highly, highly successful. Uh, I also do a fair amount of research. And what I've discovered in, in doing that is you, you can lump, uh, as I've talked about, you can lump people into kind of these three uh, um, groups. On the left-hand side, there, there's kind of this struggling group, and, and on the right-hand side, there's the really, really excellent group where there's really a very small number of those. Um, and, and, this, and, and the curve at the top kind of shows you where things are. So there's a big pile of people on the left, a moderate amount of people in the middle, and, and fewer people to the right. The key is to start looking at what are the attributes of those different groups. And so when you look at uh, the struggling groups, uh, and you look at things, as I mentioned, culture, they ignore the culture. When, when you look at the more successful groups and see what they're doing with culture, they're aligning with culture, they're trying to figure out what the culture is and at least they can behave there. And, and if you look at the really, really excellent groups who, who have really integrated into their organizations, they're challenging the company's culture. They are directly working to help change uh, the culture. And same thing if you look at uh, the, the goal. Uh, the first, the, what I mentioned, uh, looking at efficiency. So most of those early architects are looking for efficiency gains. So a lot of that is cost savings uh, related IT. But wherever it is, it, there's a big efficiency play there. By the time you become really successful, that, that goal has changed to investment rationalization so that now the business architects are looking for ways to look at all the work that's going on and figure out what's the best work we should be doing, which of these are the best products, projects to execute our strategy. But when you get over to the excellent guys, they, they are really focused on strategy realization. Their goal is make sure the strategies that senior management wants to uh, drive are coming to fruition. The thing that people don't really get here, and, and this was a big, big aha to me when I saw it in the data, was that we all think starting business architecture is the really hard part. And if you, and it is a huge struggle. I have worked with a lot of organizations starting business architecture practices. I have started my own practice in the past. This is hard work. The, the really interesting thing, though, is it gets harder as you go. And the reason it does is the skills start shifting from technical skills that are easy to learn uh, and, and relatively easy to apply, and they start shifting to interpersonal skills, what some people call soft skills, but those are really the hard skills. So it becomes much more about influence and about leadership and about driving insight and really understand business principles uh, as opposed to process type work. So. I think that's the reason that there's very, very few people out here on the excellent side is that curve continues to ramp up uh, the, the longer your practice exists. So how are these guys that are successful in building sustainable practices, how are they doing that? The, the first thing they do is they recognize reality. And I will be the first to tell you I don't like staring reality in the face, uh, but but I have learned that that's the very first thing you have to do. You have to understand what the way the world really works around you. Uh, one of those is that the CEO dictates the what but not the how. I, I talk to many business architects who want to make statements like the CEO is the architect of the company. That, that's, not, that's not the way it works. CEOs want to tell people set goals about what we're going to do, 
and they want the organization to figure out how. Business is driven by financial objectives and not not strategic plans. Uh, at the end of the day, they all we may have strategic plans, but those plans are only valuable if they really help us meet uh, our financial objectives. And it's always about making money. We can talk about all kinds of lofty goals, customer service, blah blah all that. At the end of the day, your company does not exist if it does not make money. And everything is a trade-off. There's never enough money to do it right. And remember I said we all like to be right. Uh, there's, there's never enough money to do it that way, so we're trying to find the, the best fit for the money we have. Uh, businesses are looking for long-term investment certainty. It's no different than if you invest in the stock market. When businesses invest in you as a business architect, they want some kind of assurance that you're going to actually return something to them that, that's of value. Uh, and, and for them, customer acceptance, time to market, those are the kind of things that are valuable. Again, not technology, uh, efficiency kinds of things. And, and at the end of the day, people trust who, they, who and what they know. So until you build a certain amount of credibility out there, you're not going to make much headway. And in fact, that, that is one of the keys to moving from that struggling side of business architecture in, into the successful side is developing credibility. The second thing that these guys do, which I find fascinating, is they do what works. And there's a ton of theory about business architecture, and the architects who want to go apply that theory as if it were the way to practice business architecture, by and large, fail. It may take them a year or two, but by and large, they fail. And it's interesting that there's a whole bunch of theory out there that says, oh, the first thing you do is you build a big pool of blueprints so you can describe your organization completely. And that's good theory. And that's the kind of theory I learned in college about uh, the, the topics I studied. But... In reality, that's not the way it works. And so I think what you find is as these uh, architects move from that startup phase into the succeeding phase, they're rapidly shedding their theoretical views and starting to look around and say, well, what's going to work? And, and more importantly, what's going to work here for me? Another thing they do is solve the right problem. Um, there's a ton of symptoms going on out there in your organization, and frequently what we do is we aim at the symptoms because they're clear. It's what everybody's complaining about. Uh, my role for, for 15 years was to be kind of an organizational fixer in a Fortune 100 company, and my boss would send me out to run an organization and fix it, and he would always tell me, this is what's wrong with the organization. Go fix it. He was never right about that. He, he knew what the symptoms were. And he was telling me symptoms, but he really didn't know what was going on in the organization. And, and one of the reasons I was successful was I would slow down long enough to really understand what the problems are. A, a good example of this in architectural, by the way, is application portfolio analysis. That is a symptom. You can do a portfolio rationalization. You can cut out a bunch of uh, applications. You can save a ton of money, and that's really good stuff. And five years later, you can do it again. And five years later, you can do it again. Because it's a symptom. It's not a problem. And until you solve the problem, the symptoms keep coming back. The other thing about solving the right problems is you have to take into account the culture and the context. Because problems do not just, they're not created intentionally. Very few are anyway. There might be a few that some guys do, but largely, the problems that exist in your company exist because somebody was trying to do what they thought was right. And that is driven largely by the culture of how they think the organization works and how they will succeed. And it is driven by the context, which are things like rewards and promotion uh, in, in, in organizational structures and those kind of things. So to be successful, part of what you have to do is get your hands around what's, what's the right thing to solve. So going through all this, there, there's a bunch of challenges to move into sustainability. The 
The first one is what got you here won't get you there. And I think this is a big factor for the enterprise architects who are moving into business architecture. What, what made them really successful enterprise architects won't make them really successful business architects. Uh, same way with the guys who are, in, who are process folks. Modeling is really good, a good thing to be able to do, a core skill. It won't make you successful as a business architect. Overcoming politics, culture, organizational, contextual challenges. I, I've talked about that numerous times uh, in the last few minutes. This is the key. I mean, this is the key. And we can't just expect we'll work our way through it. We have to build plans and strategies and techniques to deal with that. Raising executive collaboration. Again, I mentioned that um, part of the challenge in most organizations have a lot of siloed behavior. And so one of the big challenges is how do I get these executives who don't necessarily want to play together to play together. Implementing a top-down strategy execution process, one of the things we see over and over again is companies have great strategy, they have great ideas, they have great strategy, they have poor implementation processes for that strategy. And in fact, most companies have more process around buying post-it notes than they do implementing corporate strategy. And every single business architecture team that I talk with who is kind of in that successful group are all either have developed a top-down strategy execution process or are trying very, very hard to do it. It's, it's fundamentally their number one goal. Creating broad senior level advocacy, another uh, big important thing. It's, it's an unfortunate um, situation, but I've seen it multiple times where business architecture team starts up, they're very successful, they're doing well, Management changes, new leaders come in, look around and say, I don't know why I'm paying all those guys all that money. I don't get what they do. Let's have them do something else, and it goes away. And so one of the keys to long-term sustainability is to get broad support. Uh, it's, not, it's not good enough, even if, even if it's the CEO. CEOs change jobs quite a bit. Uh, shifting individual credibility to practice credibility. I talked about how to be successful, you've got to develop personal credibility. One of the bigger challenges is once you build a business architecture team with a bunch of credible business architects, how do you translate that from personal credibility so that it's for the team credibility, so that it's not, oh, I need Jeff to come work on my project. It's I need one of those business architecture guys. Developing a strong uh, consulting engagement approach. Uh, very few business architects architecture teams see themselves kind of as consultants, but that seems to be a predominant model for the successful business architects. And reducing competition and increasing collaboration. Yes, you have competitors. You have people in the process management space. You have customer experience designers. You have uh, PMO offices. You have enterprise architects. You have a whole bunch of people who think it's their job to do part of business architecture. And when you jump in and start doing it, you are actually competing with them, and, and you have to resolve that. And then hiring and developing staff. Uh, the, the, most, the most difficult thing that business architects tell me is finding ex good, experienced business architects. And, and I think the last challenge here that seems to be so important is thinking bigger, meaning that when you start your business architecture initiative, thinking through what you really want it to be and having a vision for that that's, that is big enough that you can, it will stretch what you do. You might never quite grow into that vision, but it will constantly stretch you to do more, to be better, um, and, and move the organization forward. So a lot of challenges, but remember, I started off with the concept that business architects are really smart guys. That we can solve all these challenges. The key is giving up some of our uh, strongly held beliefs about what business architecture is and how we should go about pursuing business architecture in our company. So thank you very much for being here today. I now want to introduce my friend and, and fellow business architect, Diane LeBeau. Diane is the Director of Business Architecture at uh, United. 
She established the company's first business architecture team there in 2008 and is responsible for business capability and strategy alignment, transformation activities as it relates to business readiness and impact analysis, as well as portfolio and business engagement. Prior to business architecture, Diane worked in operations managing customer service at one of United's hubs where she was responsible for customer satisfaction, employee engagement, and continuous improvement over three uh, separate airport terminals. Diane, take it away. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, and thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, our journey of standing up the business architecture uh, discipline here at United. I'm going to cover just a few facts about United, and then uh, some information about our actual business ar architecture team that has been evolving since we started. Um, our challenges and opportunities that we saw when we started back in 2008, and where we're headed today. So today, United serves 373 airports. We have 5,507 United and United Express flights per day. That's an awful lot of arrivals and departures. You can only imagine the activity that goes on and throw in some um, weather or some other issues, and that's a lot of um, management of operations. We're the founding member of Star Alliance, which has um, provides service to 193 countries via 27 member airlines. And we have more than 84,000 United employees residing in the U.S. and in the countries around the world. So when I move forward and tell you how many business architects we have on our, on our team, you'll wonder how in the world are we, are we able to manage such a large, complex environment with six very good architects. Um, and there's many reasons behind that, which I'll explain as we go through the um, presentation. But we are part of the enterprise architecture team within IT, and we report to the managing director of enterprise architecture. This is all within the CTO office within IT. I have an awesome team. That's why I had to put that on there. They're just fantastic leaders, um, and they each bring a different skill set. Um, Melissa is um, a senior architect with us and she has extensive experience as a business analyst and, a system, and in system develop, development methodology, which I can explain why that helps us. We usually have a number of challenges, especially when we go beyond the waterfall approach in projects, thinking that business architecture is going to stall the movement uh, or the progression of, this, of the development team. And Melissa is so good at explaining to them how business architecture supports all methodologies. Then I have Diana Crone. She's an excellent um, uh, principal architect. Her background is in industrial engineering and um, very process focused, and she's got an extensive knowledge of United. Molly just joined our team, again, an industrial engineer, uh, principal architect, and she comes from the consulting world. Dipti is another senior architect. Uh, she has extensive experience with uh, program management as well as she uh, was a business analyst. This helps us relate to our program managers, our project managers within IT and the business and the PMO office. Jason is a principal architect and he's got an operational background, much like myself, but he comes from our customer contact and loyalty um, division. And then Barry joined us. He's a senior architect as well. And he's got a computer science background and worked in our application testing area. So he helps us understand how our work can um, work very well with our testing team, who actually uses our, our models quite frequently. So that's a little bit about the team and their background and what we look at, uh, what we look for in each of our architects. So when we started back in 2008, we had gotten a business uh, capability model. It was an industry model. Uh, it was from um, originally from IBM. Uh, and we reported to the chief architect, which again was within the enterprise architecture team. Our focus at that time was on impact analysis 
um, pretty much of new efforts and trying to build a repository of current states as well as associations to those um, capabilities. And as um, you heard Jeff say, that's not always the best approach. Um, you can get yourself caught up into the modeling part of it, thinking you have to you know, build this repository before you can move forward. So and as I go through this presentation, I, I hope to explain how we overcome that. And, and uh, though there were some opportunities, probably wasn't the, the best uh, approach. The challenges we faced, especially in 2008, is uh, leadership changes. And I know um, Jeff mentioned that as well in one of his slides. So constantly having to reintroduce business architecture and the value proposition was extremely difficult. And I spent a good deal of my time um, working on my sales pitch, actually with many, many of the leaders within IT. Uh, in fact, at that point in time, I hadn't even ventured outside of IT because I was so busy within IT. So the question for us was, how do you continue to show value, immediate value, especially during an environment change? In the beginning, and we had a very small team at back in 2008, there was only three of us, actually. Um, we were heavily project focused. And, and um, what we figured out is, A, we started to realize value quite quickly inside the project team. The other thing we gained from that, instead of trying to run around and ask everyone what their current state was, we used and leveraged the opportunity to work with the project teams to start building our repository. That was a lot easier than us trying to do uh, and capture current state um, outside of the project world. So that was one of the ways we started to build our repository without having to knock on doors and explain who we are and what we did. We were part of, back in 2008, a technology review board, which was great. Um, and we focused on the impact to capability. I can't really say the discussion went much further than that. It was a great introduction. We had a seat at the table. But I knew we needed to go further with this and to really leverage the material the way it meant to be leveraged. But at that point in time, that's all the culture and the leadership was asking us um, to do. And so we weren't going to walk away from that table. The idea is, is once that door is opened, uh, you have to push yourself in there. It may not be exactly what you want to achieve at that moment in time, but at least you're ha you have a seat at the table. We did have an opportunity uh, in the early years to develop um, a roadmap. It went quite well with one of our divisions. Um, unfortunately, at that time, it was a, uh, what happened there is that we had a decision to merge with um, Continental Airlines. And so therefore, this particular effort with that organization had stopped. So we weren't able to continue and mature that aspect of it. We continued to focus on um, program and projects as we, in our early years, as I had described earlier. Now, where we're at today, and as a result of the merger, the opportunities you have to jump on as soon as you see them. When you understand what you would like to accomplish with business architecture, if you understand what it's meant to do and how it's meant to be leveraged, you have to seize the moments that they become available to you. It has been impossible for me to go to leadership and say, this is business architecture. You should take everything about business architecture. It's the best. Leverage it all at once. Um, and that just doesn't work that way. And Jeff had described there's so many other things going on within a company. You are part of it. You just have to seize the moment. And so where we're at today is that the merger of Continental and United brought a great opportunity for us to leverage our ability as a business architecture team to help with the integration of both airlines, capturing the business processes identifying where there was no harmonization, working with the business leaders to harmonize the business processes, understand uh, where there were differences or where decisions had to be made as far as how the company was going to move forward. This gave us 
um, a role at a higher level within the company. It brought us outside of IT. And for the last five years, we've been building up our repository and deciding how, what role do we play moving forward. So now in 2016, we're focused on our governance and our standardization of deliverables. I think one of the things that uh, Jeff mentioned was it's, it's not about process models, and I agree completely. But when it comes to standardizing the deliverables, we're using it as a branding opportunity. So the architects, when they're working, whether it's within IT, because they're also a line of business, or outside of IT with the other lines of business within the enterprise, we make sure that the documents are recognized as business architecture documents. I don't want it to truly be, oh, I'm going to contact Diane LeBeau. I want it to be, I'm going to contact the business architecture team. So we're working on all of those um, deliverables and standardizing them now that we have a larger team of six. We have uh, matured our development of working with programs and projects. We actually go beyond an impact analysis and, and working with current state. We help them understand and clarify scope. We help the business articulate what their needs are and help them not include the technology they want in that ask, but more or less explain what does the business want to change. We document current and future state when necessary. Sometimes we just go straight to future state if that's what the business is looking for or the program is looking for. We're very flexible that way. Identifying pain points and opportunities and impacts proves to be very valuable, and we're working with each of our engagements to how can they leverage that information. We document high-level business requirements and align with the future state, and we're leveraging the document so that we, in working with the project team, we explain if scope changes, if you cannot deliver 100% of your scope and achieve everything you had wanted to at the very beginning, then leveraging our models and leveraging the traceability between your requirements and alignment back to your future state, when you de-scope, it'll help you understand the value you're delivering and maybe what needs to be delivered next. The last thing is something that has kept us very, very busy over the last year is applying a capability-based approach in um, a number of areas as a result of actions taken by our CIO. So within the performance and reliability, from an application perspective, we have actually turned the table and said performance and reliability will be based on, a, on capability. We will talk about what business processes are impacted, not what specific app may not be performing the way the business needs. What have we, how can we continue to help the business um, by being stable and reliable? Change and release management also will have a capability-based approach as well as our IT intake process. So this is a huge change for us. It has, again, elevated us to the CIO level um, and has brought more visibility as far as how you can leverage the material the business architecture team has um, can produce and how you can leverage our services because we do actually work as a consulting. We're, we're agnostic of any application. We're agnostic of any really truly division. We go in and, and we work with each of our uh, engagements as if we were consultants. So just to walk you through some examples of, of um, the roadmaps, what we have here is an example of a roadmap that we did and continue to work on. It works with identifying outcomes, identifying strategies, and identifying what needs to change as it, re as it relates to that business capability. And we try to capture the stakeholders, the KPIs, and the measurements by which this capability is um, run by the business. Next is just an example of some of the documents that we produce for programs and projects. 
Again, we can get some very detailed process models if the engagement um, demands. We can capture requirements, which are then related back to those activities within those process models to help the business define their high-level business requirements. And then many times after our engagement, we'll package this and go back to the um, engagement and the entire team and talk through the themes that we're seeing, whether or not we see some changes that are needed around data and information or changes in communication, possibly changes in processes outside of the need for technology, and those changes that are needed to be supported by technology. So we try and package uh, our findings and give it back to the team, um, categorizing each of the, the areas. The last example here we have is from our strategy and capability engagement. And what we have done here is we took our capability model and we identified the critical, most critical capabilities that support the enterprise. We then, with our associations, identified those applications that support each of these capabilities. And in doing so, we then pivoted off of that information and had each of the managing directors own a capability and become accountable for the performance of that business capability based on the application and the infrastructure supporting that. So this has been a great opportunity for the entire company to understand the importance of business capabilities and the possible business processes that support each of those capabilities. We've extended our engagement to include an effort with um, a team that reports directly to our CEO. And because of the work that we did on our strategy and reliability and performance, we were asked to engage on an enterprise effort to document a particular pain point and this particular pain point has been um, brought up to the CEO. So we've been asked to join that team. And over the next month, we'll be working very closely to document the pain points and opportunities and provide an overall assessment of the health of that capability. This is a great opportunity for the team. It's probably the first CEO engagement we've had. And it, it brings such visibility to the practice and the value of the um, assets that we have and how they can be leveraged. That's our, that's our journey. That's where we are today. I have to comment that Jeff hit, on, hit the nail on the head when he said the journey doesn't stop. We continue to look for opportunities. We um, are working on the strategic side of this, and that's another area. You know, based on your culture and, and the makeup of your company, that may not be an area you can just jump in. It may be owned by someone else, and very possibly they really don't want you come knocking on the door. So what you have to do is find a way to show value and that they can leverage your work without having other organizations feel like you're going to step in and want to own everything. Uh, we don't own the business processes. Uh, we don't own any of this material. What we're here to do is help you understand how to leverage it, how it can um, ex expedite um, your programs and, and your efforts so that you can get to the end result quicker. So I want to thank everyone for allowing me to share United's journey. And um, in the future, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to send those to me, and hopefully I can help you with your journey moving forward. Um, I have a lot more examples to share, but it would have taken up far too much time. So I want to thank everyone again, and your questions are welcome. Thank you. All right, Diane. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that, and uh, want to congratulate you and the team on being able to uh, really get uh, quite a few things accomplished at United. Uh, helping them to uh, leverage business architecture and do business architecture the right way, uh, as Jeff said. And uh, Jeff, any closing comments? 
Yeah, I just as I was listening to Diane, I just a number of things popped out uh, that that were really good. So I, when I was listening to Diane, she talked about things that they did that that are are exactly the things people do to create successful architecture programs like she has. So I just want to summarize a few of those, and then I have a question for Diane. Uh, one is she picked business architects with leadership skills, and that is so so important. She leveraged relationships that she had to get to, to be able to get connected to the people she needed as well as find the information she needed. She branded uh, what they were doing. I'm a big believer in, in creating uh, kind of a brand for the team and, and having the team almost run like a business, and I, I love that branding uh, view. Standardized deliverables so that people recognize what you have as well as gives you the ability to improve them. Once you're doing standard deliverables as opposed to one-off, you can improve them all the time. Working as consultants, I talked about that earlier, uh, but that seems to be the powerful model. Um, and, and I like that one of the last things you talked about there was that oh, well, well, the, the things they created, they didn't own them, that the business owns the architecture, the architects are really the facilitators of that process. But the other thing she talked about was uh, being opportunistic, and I, I love the seize the moment piece because that's that's so critical. But but Diane, you also talked about kind of moving beyond that in, uh, in the large. And in, in so the the question I have for you is is what would you tell people about how to move from being opportunistic, which is almost reactive, which we all have to do and continue to do forever, but but to start to drive your own vision for what you can deliver as a business architecture function? That's a, that's a, a, a great question. I, I, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I'm not focused on how to move forward rather than to react. And once the relationships have been established and once you have an idea of the culture that you are working in, you can almost begin to predict where things will begin to pop up, where you need to start engaging sooner than later. Um, and the relationships you establish as you build those, then you start almost in, yeah, getting the other people that you engage with to start thinking the same way. Now the phone calls are starting to come in to say, you know, we had this particular discussion, and I had this problem, and I immediately thought of your team. I think you guys can help us with this because I remember when I worked with you a while back, it was really very helpful. I had a discussion the other day where someone, when I was walking them through, they had come and wanted to talk about exactly what it is that you know we did and if they could help us, and when I started to show them what we might be able to do, their comment was, how many people know about you? So I think, Jeff, you can never stop thinking about where you need to be in order to be proactive and jump on a situation. So I am constantly listening, and I'm constantly just showing my face and just saying, let me know if we can help you. Um, and making sure that in the engagements that we have, the teams that we are working with, the partners, when we partner, no matter what level, the senior level, the you know, project team level, they understand what it is that we do so that they'll think of us next time. Yeah, I, th I think that's excellent. Thank you, Diane. All right, actually, and if I could, Diane, I, I wanted to throw a question in. Um, you know, for folks that are really just getting started and are trying to identify um, the members that they want on their team, is there any uh, parts of the business or any specific profile that you would recommend uh, that they uh, try to include as participants on that team? Um, and, and maybe if you could also give a, a comment to uh, the role that training uh, might uh, serve here in helping to get the folks the right resources that they need on their team. Sure. I can. Um, I think I have continually said um, I look for very strong leadership and facilitation skills. I can't say enough about those two skills. 
I think facilitating discussions with a cross-functional group when the cross-functional group has and or believes their problem is so complex and you will be thrown a number of different situations, ideas about current state, future state, the conversation is, is all around and, and you suddenly realize why a lot of things don't get accomplished in a single meeting, a truly good facilitator can work through all that noise and, and, and walk away and then the very next day produce a deliverable that everyone sits back and goes, wow, how'd you do that? Um, because they're able to work through that complex conversation and get to the root of what they need. Um, the other, the other skill set is is not taking the ability to realize that you're a um, you're a third party in all this and that you're actually um, providing a service. So it's a little bit back to my customer service days. Um, I'm here to provide a service, and you, that takes a certain mindset. Um, and that at times it may not be exactly what you want to deliver, but it's going to be close to it, and so you may have to adapt or be flexible. So I look for someone who's flexible. As far as um, formal training classes, they're, they're needed, especially when I find I'm taking um, a very good business analyst and wanting them to move into the business architecture role because I need to raise their awareness and, and have them start thinking at an enterprise level. Uh, I do like um, someone who's familiar with the business because they can speak with the business and you can easily and quickly develop um, a relationship that is needed to be leveraged uh, moving forward. So the training plays a, um, a big part, when, especially when I want to raise the knowledge of that we're now going to operate at an enterprise level. And I can't always do that from an OJT perspective. But um, that's why I find industrial engineers who have a process um, mindset. Um, not every industrial engineer has good leadership skills, so that, that's unique. Um, and not everyone is a good facilitator. So those are, those are just some main skills that I look for. All right, super. Well, I appreciate uh, you sharing that, uh, Diane. And I just wanted to thank um, you, just yourself and the folks at United for allowing you to come and, and share the successes that you guys had and uh, share those experiences with the community. Uh, I hope we can uh, continue to stay in touch and uh, see how things continue to progress. Uh, we obviously wish you well on, uh, on the journey. And I wanted to thank uh, Jeff Scott as well, our editorial director, here at Business Architecture Institute. Um, as I mentioned, part of our main theme for this year is going to be around uh, helping folks from that startup mode onto sustainability. And you can look for us to focus on uh, more case studies uh, throughout our upcoming webcasts as well as uh, at our events, uh, specifically in the back half of the year here in Washington, D.C. and New York. Um, we are out of time for today's session, but if you folks have any additional questions for Jeff or Diane, feel free to send those to me at Greg Rock, or I should say G Rock at BAinstitute.org, and we will pass those along. And we look forward to hosting everybody at an upcoming webcast. Thank you both, uh, Jeff and Diane. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Bye-bye now.